Let's have our seats. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bonas, if you This county praise the Lord. And this county praise the Lord. That county praise the Lord. And this county praise the Lord. I'm so glad to be in the house of the Lord. I'm so happy to, to have this opportunity to share God's word. I want to thank my friends for giving me this opportunity to share God's word. He likes surprising me. Now I've even gotten used. Whatever it is, we just continue. But thank you so much for entrusting me with this pulpit. And I know that you'll be blessed. Praise the Lord. Um, in the last one week, there is a story which has been going on in the social media of a story of a certain pastor who had a wonderful choir. I think like this one of ours here. And this choir, but they, in their, in their, where they came from, they used to go for competitions. And every time they went, they won. And the pastor was their number one cheerleader. He used to attend all those competitions to cheer his choir. And this time around, they had also been invited for another competition. And the pastor decided to join them. Fortunately or unfortunately, two days to the competition, the pastor died. I don't be sorry. See, he went to heaven. He was a pastor. So, <laughs> but now this pastor, when he got to heaven, he was very happy. And, uh, but he told Jesus, I'm so glad I'm here, but I was really looking forward to go and see my choir compete. And Jesus told him, don't worry, we will make arrangements. And he was handed over to an angel and he was taken to a place where he would see his choir performing and hear them sing. And he was very excited. When he, where he was taken, he was only hearing one voice, the soprano, one soprano voice. But he could see everybody was singing. But the volume was zero apart from one whom they were hearing. Then he wondered, what is happening? How come today I can see they are all singing and I can't hear what they are saying? This is what the, the angel told him. You know, here is heaven. In heaven, we only hear those who are worshipping and praising in spirit and truth. That one's, that one soprano is the only one singing and worshipping in spirit and truth. Therefore, as heaven, as far as heaven was concerned, only one person was performing. The others are making noise. This is my prayer this morning. You are seated here. My prayer is that as God looks from heaven, he will see many present in his presence to hear what he has to say to them. My prayer is that you will be among the number. That we will not count you present here and in heaven you are absent. Because God looks at the heart while we look at the physical. Praise the Lord. Do I have people present in the house? You are ready to hear God's word? Even heaven has confirmed that. You speak it, heaven confirms it. Praise the Lord. Today, I don't know what you, comes to your mind. Maybe when you have applied for a job or for a business opportunity or for a visa and you get communication maybe through email or maybe a letter and you get communication like, thank you so much. And then there is an, a next paragraph which starts like this. I regret. What does it tell you? There is something not right, eh? It, it precedes something negative. Something, you know, or 
another word maybe as synonymous would be I am sorry. There is some disappointment behind I regret. And this morning if there is any word I would want to urge every one of us to be cautious about is for God to tell you I regret. Can you imagine the way you feel bad when a human being tells you I regret? How much more when God tells you I regret? And this morning, I want us to share very quickly from the word of God. And we are going to read from the book of 1 Samuel. We will keep on moving from chapter 15 and chapter 16. But I want us to start from 1 Samuel 16 and verse 10. Maybe the media can project it for us in NIV. Never mind if, okay, no. Is that First Samuel 16, verse 10? Verse 10? Okay. You'll tell me which verse it was when I read it for you here. <laughs> so you're the ones with the Bibles there. <laughs> but this is what the Bible says. At least I know it is in the Bible. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was very, was angry and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Which verse is it? Ah, Kuba Muripata. How come we were reading something different? Yes, this is where I was looking for. And verse 11, God said that he regretted having blessed somebody, having blessed King Saul. And I started by saying, my prayer would be that it will never come a point that God will regret for what he has already done for you. Being chosen as a king was something very good. But it came a time when God regretted. In another version, in the message version, it says, maybe you can project it for us, the same verse, but in message version it says, Then God spoke to Samuel. I am sorry I ever made Saul king. He turned his back on me. He refuses to do what I tell him. Verse, the next verse says, Samuel was angry when he heard this. He prayed his anger and disappointment all through the night. That is the message version. That God was very sorry that he appointed Saul as king. Why? Because he has turned his back on me. He refuses to do what I tell him. And no wonder Samuel... Because God had used the same Samuel to anoint him king. You remember the story? When Jesse was bringing his sons. No, when uh, Samuel went to anoint Saul. And incidentally, what is being referred here that he disobeyed, it is the same Samuel who took the message. And maybe it's good to refresh our memories. What were the instructions which made God say, I regret I am sorry. And maybe you can say, I am disappointed. Meaning there was an unmet expectation. God had an expectation which was not met. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 1 to 3, we are going to read about the instructions. Which he said to have refused to obey. Uh, in NIV, I know we had some internet challenges. Can you project it in verse 1 to 3 in NIV, please? Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. Verse 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they were raided them as they came up from Egypt. Verse 3. 
Now go. These were the specifications, the specifics. Attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Those were the instructions. Uh, destroying the Amalekites was not Saul's idea. It was God's idea. And when I was reading this story, I got interested. I wanted to know why, why, why did God want to, to do such a destruction? To finish including the cattle. Even the infants, innocent infants, but God wanted them cleared, each one of them. I wanted to know. And maybe very quickly we can look at the book of Exodus chapter 17. Exodus 17, and we are going to read verse 14. This is a story we all know, and we like quoting it, where Moses was on the mountain. And the Israelites were fighting the Amalekites down the valley. NIV, please. Okay, let's read the message. God said to Moses, write this up as a reminder to Joshua to keep it before him because I will most certainly wipe out the very memory of Amalek off the face of the earth. Verse 15. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely brought out the name of Amalek from under heaven. God was disappointed by the Amalekites. They really harassed the children of Israel. And God made a promise and he demanded that Joshua should hear about it. Because he will completely wipe them out. And it's at this point that he's telling Saul to go out and accomplish this mission. So it was God's idea. When God gives an instruction, it is not your idea. He does not expect you to edit it, to modify it, to simplify it. He expects you to carry it out exactly that. And because we are all familiar with this story, when actually Saul attempted to do this, but only that he did it at his own terms. He decided he's going to execute his, these instructions at his own terms. And maybe we can read from 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 9. Let's start from verse 8. You hear, God had planned to do this many years back. But he has honored sorrow with the responsibility of carrying out his plan. But Saul has decided he will do it at his own terms. And this is what he did. Um, let's start from verse 7. I want us to get the, the flow of the story. Sorry about that. Um, then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havila to Shu to the east of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. Verse 9. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and the rams, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely. But everything that was despised and weak, 
they totally destroyed. You note the instructions God had given. And you also note how Saul carried out the instructions. He did it at his own terms. Saul and his men obeyed as far as it suited them. And that is to say, they did not obey God at all, but their own inclinations. Both in sparing the good and in destroying the worthless. What was not worth carrying off, they destroyed. And what they thought was good. Can you imagine? He even spared the king. What can we say about this? Partial obedience. And the challenge I'm bringing to each one of us. Remember we agreed that we are all in church this morning. Partial obedience. How well are you carrying out the instructions? You know when Saul was being given these instructions by Samuel, he was alone. The Bible says now when he was given the message, he went and told his armies what he has been told by God through Samuel. Somebody said, there may be only a coil of the snake visible, but that betrays the presence of the streamer folds, though they are covered from sight among the leaves. The tiny shoot of a plant peeping above the ground does not augur that the roots are short. They may learn for yards, nor can any act be called small of which the motive is disregarding God's praying command. In other words, there is no room when God gives an instruction to minimize the fact that you didn't do what he told you. This one cost Saul his kingdom, his kingship. And God told him, I regret. He went back to the same Samuel who anointed Saul and said, let me tell you what God told me. He regrets that you are the king at a time like this. And this I am coming to bring us to this morning. God is more interested with the why than the what. When Saul did not destroy everything, he wanted to justify that. In fact, at some point he said that he had spared those lambs and cattle that they may go and offer it a sacrifice. And this is where Samuel came out so strongly and said, to obey is better than sacrifice. So it matters how you carry out the instruction that God has given you. It matters how you carry out the calling that God has put in your life. Serving God, but not at your own terms. And maybe there are a few reasons before I sit down. We can run from the life of Saul. In verse 13 of chapter 15. 15 verse 13. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. You saw the instructions? We have also seen what he did. And here, he want to fool the servant of God, Samuel. And he, if it was in today's language, he would say, praise the Lord. I have done, I have carried out the Lord's instructions. Bless the Lord. This is what Saul, and one of the lessons we can learn is, Saul was dishonest. He failed the integrity test. When he said, I have carried out the Lord's instructions, are you sure he did? Are you sure he did? He carried out instructions, but not the Lord's instructions. He failed the integrity test. This morning, have you failed the integrity test? What I like about God is that he comes to you as a person. He's the one who calls you as a person. And you are the only one who knows what he told you to do. Have you done it the way he has asked you to do? Remember what God has given you is meant for the body of Christ. It is meant for the church family. 
It is meant to benefit your family, your extended family members, your place of work, your church. They are supposed to benefit from that which God has given you. There are some things that God has asked you to do. Have you been faithful? Saul, we can say, was dishonest. Lesson number two, we can learn from the behavior of Saul. He refused to take responsibility. In verse 20, But I did obey the Lord. Imagine he was daring the, 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 the prophet. I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned to me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought out back Agag, their king. Can't you see the contradiction? I completely did it, but I spared the king. I think when he was saying completely, it was louder. And when he said I spared the king, maybe he reduced the volume. He was dishonest. Can God call you dishonest? That you tell people what you want them to hear. Remember where we started. That in heaven, he only sees the sincere. Or rather, only the sincere service, services go into record. And no wonder on that day the Bible says, many will come and tell him, we did great things. But he'll say, sorry, I never knew you. Why? Because even the motive matters. How you carry out the instructions matters. He refused to take responsibility. He contradicted himself. Lesson number three. He blamed others, yet he's the one who was given instructions. In verse 21, this is what he was telling Samuel. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the Prada. I want you to note the soldiers, not him. Eh? The best of what was devoted to God in order to sacrifice them to the God, to the Lord, you are God at Giggle. Not even his God, you are God, okay? He wanted to blame, to blame the soldiers. Who was given the instructions? Whom do you blame? When things don't go right. Don't worry. The brain game started from the way back at the Garden of Eden. This woman that you gave me. When we refused to take responsibility. I'm talking to the Christians hearing this, me this morning. To run to take responsibility. When you take responsibility there is hope for you. When you admit you are wrong there is forgiveness in the house. Saul refused to take responsibility and blamed others for the wrong that had happened. Now that he had been discovered, it had been discovered that he never carried out the instruction. Another lesson we can learn from Saul. He had become so proud and full of himself. Verse 12. Let's read together verse 12. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul. But he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor. And has turned and gone on down to Giga. I want you to note, he has carried the instructions at his own terms. As if that is not enough. I want you to project that, that verse again. As if that is not enough. He set up a monument in his own honor. And has stand and gone on. A monument. How many self monuments have you set up for yourself? God helped you. God gave you victory. Somebody said some of us worship at the monument of self. Everything about me, I have done this, I have done this, I am this, I have achieved this. Everything is about you. I am here to bring to each one of us. That does not please God. When, and I would want 
you to contrast it. In the, in the story we read in Exodus chapter 17, when God gave Joshua victory over the Amalekites, he erected an altar and said, the Lord is my banner. When the Lord does go you good, when the Lord gives you victory, he expects you to build an altar and give him glory as you continue enjoying the blessings. Therefore, this morning, for the blessings that God has given you, have you changed your story? That these days, the testimony is what you have done, not what God has done. May God help us this morning. That, we, that is a sign of pride. That everything that you have, you will count it but loss and pour contempt on all your pride. Because I liked what one of the leaders who, was, who stood here earlier said, I think it's Brother Samuel, he said that all that you are, you owe it to God. Without him, you are nothing. Were it not for him, were it not for the grace of God, those things you are worshipping today, you would have none of them. May God help us this morning. That when he blesses you and he lifts you up, you will remember to, lift an, to raise an altar and say, this far the Lord has done it for me. And this was not so for Saul. And of course, lesson number five. He had no respect for authority. Were it not for time, we would have read, maybe you can go and read the whole of First Samuel chapter 15. Before he agreed that he has done wrong, he had really engaged the prophet, trying to justify that he has done nothing wrong. He had no respect. When you have respect for certain authority, you take responsibility and admit you are wrong. That is one of the marks that you respect a certain authority. But when you are trying to engage and to justify, and you know what? Some things, they are gazing at you like this. For example, in this case, actually Samuel asked him, and the sheep I'm hearing, the breathing, and the cattle, yani the evidence is like this. And you are still trying to prove a point. I'm here to submit to us. To run to admit when we go wrong. Because when we do that, there is grace in the house. But for Saul, he kept arguing with the prophet. No wonder the message was, I regret. And this morning, what I like is that you are the only one who can evaluate yourself. You are the one who knows what you agreed with God. You are the one you know, who knows the oath you made before God. The promises you gave him. And as I wind up, I would want us to look at God's verdict. In 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 7. This was God's verdict of the whole scenario. But the Lord said to Samuel, Remember, when God gave Samuel the message that he regrets, Samuel was so disappointed. He was so sad. The Bible says he cried the whole night. He really loved Saul. And he was very disappointed. And he kept on mourning about Saul. And at this juncture, the Lord comes to Samuel and he says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider this appearance his appearance of his, of his hate. For I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And that's why I started by telling you, it is what is in your heart. Why did you come to church today? Do you know you are the only one who has the answer? Why did you come to church today? Depending on the answer to that question, you are either present or absent in heaven. As God delivers the blessings, you may 
be part of it or you may miss out depending on your motive why because god does not look on the outside he looks on the inside and no wonder the verdict is actually it was a, a, a rebuke to samuel stop wasting time i've already rejected him and you know somebody said no 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 appeal god's case no appeal unless you but you can appeal for yourself you remember a, a certain king who appealed to god when he was told he would die but he had enough reasons to put up a case before god look at my sacrifices and imagine god had the appeal and it was ruled in his favor God's case, no appeal, unless yourself. Actually, in the New Living Translation, it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge by his appearance or hate, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. How I pray that each one of us will desire to be judged by God. And God will look from the inside. But in verse 28. Verse 28, we can read verse 28. Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn, king, torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors. To one better than you. Tell your neighbor there is somebody better than you. You don't want to do it. At his terms. There is someone better than you. If you want to know. Ask Queen Vashti. In the book of Esther chapter 1 and verse 19. Vashti was summoned by the king. She refused she was very busy with other women enjoying a banquet. And the king was very disappointed and felt very disrespected. And maybe you can project it for us. Esther chapter 1 and verse 19. This is where now Vashti has been summoned. She has refused. The king is so annoyed. He has called his readers. You know, the one, he was let down in the presence of his readership. Eh? And this is what happened. Therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Saxis. Also, let the king give her royal possession to someone else who is better than she. I want you to tell your neighbor there is someone better than you. Actually, whatever it is that you are doing is just by the grace of God. Somebody else can do it and do it even better than you. So if I were you, now that I have been chosen, praise God. The Bible says that he has chosen. I didn't choose myself, he chose me. Now that he has given me that favor, he has looked at me with favor and he has chosen me. I am the best. I am his choice. I will do the best I can. Tell your neighbor, do your best. Does she look like she's hearing or he's hearing? I want you to repeat to him or her. Do your best because you are his choice. And if you don't, there is somebody better than you. And I have got good news for you this morning. It is possible to become God's preferred choice. Because he does not look at the outside appearance. He will only look for your motive. How I pray that we will align our, our motives with his will. And as long as you do that, you will remain his preferred choice. And I know each one of us would want to be his preferred choice. 
And, what, and becoming God's preferred choice is simple. Do it as he has told you. And the good thing, he has given you a helper. You can ask for help and he will help you. And if you have lost it, you can appeal to him. Before it is take, given back to somebody better than yourself. You know, if each one of us did as God has instructed, we would, you would leave a mark. On Tuesday, I, start, I attended a, a certain funeral of an old man who was 89. The preacher who shared was very humorous. And he kept on asking us. It happened that the man who was being buried uh, was a father to two pastors, two deliverance church pastors. And the preacher kept on asking, this old man lying here has left to us two preachers. And now, now, you know, in the Kiembu, was it in Kimeru? It sounded very funny. Although now he would speak in, in Kikuyu, Kimeru, na mimi, na my friend, to Narudiana na Kikuyu. So this was the question. We kept on asking one another as he was preaching. Ogatotigiraki. Yani, utatuachia nini? Can I tell you the answer I kept on? Akini uriza vile ile nikuwa na muambia. Nikuwa na muambia. Nikuwa na muambia. Nikuwa ni ninaona kuna kitu unaweza kutuachia, lakini unaweza ogeza. Praise the Lord. You know, when you ask such a question, humanly speaking, everybody thinks the other one will go before them. Sawa, sawa. So he would also tell me, it's okay, there is something you can leave, but you can add on to that one. Tell your neighbor, unazaongeza. Ide, ide, eh. Unaza kutuachia kitu. Eh, let people say you are here. Let's come closer. You know you don't like think, talking about the death. Let's come closer home. Na mungu wakikubariki. And if God blesses you, and you leave the reverence church, Zimmerman, what will you leave for us? Imagine mimi siendi, kwa hivyo utatuachia nini? What will you leave behind? What you leave behind, you don't have to think about it. As long as you carry out God's instructions the way he has given you. When you do that, I can assure you there will be something you will leave behind. There is a life you will have touched. There is somebody who will keep on remembering you. Everybody else can forget you. But there should be somebody who will not forget you. Each one of us, God intended that we leave something behind. And I want to ask you this, a few questions as I sit down. They tell me you, you keep finishing several times. Let me ask you a question. Is there an assignment which God has given you and you have changed, modified, or edited? Can God regret that he has blessed you because you have become so stubborn since the blessing? Can God regret? I regret why I gave him this car. From the day I gave him a car, coming to church is such an issue. From the day I gave her a husband, going to any meeting is such an issue. He was meant to be a blessing. She was meant to be a blessing. The Bible says two are better than one. But since the blessing, we no longer see you in the Bible study. Can God regret? Because of a certain blessing he has given you and it has taken you away from the path. And I want to ask you another question. Have you built any self-monument after God giving you victory? You prayed. God answered you. He gave you such victory. You were the best. But now, ooh, the testimony is about me, myself, and I. You have actually built a self-monument. And you keep worshipping there. Worshipping the blessing. 
Let me remind you this morning. Let me submit to you this morning. When God has blessed you, he expects you even to be a better worshiper. And you keep telling people, I am the testimony. That is God's expectation. I want you to remember this. That God has something better than you to do the assignment. It is just by grace that you are whom you are. I don't know whether the, the, me, the sound room, you have got this song. Because I want, us, I want to finish as we sing this song. When I survey the wordless cross, my riches gain, I count but rust, and poor contempt on all my pride. Because as we do that, God will remain the focus. God will not make a statement, I regret, that since I gave her a job, now anything else, anybody else, doesn't matter. May the blessings of the Lord humble us. They are meant to add no sorrow. And I would request each one of us to stand as we sing this chorus, this song together. When I suffer, and I want you to sing with understanding to help you reflect on your life as you ask yourself whether God can regret. And as you remember, God has somebody better. I love that one Kikuyu preacher who says, God's pot can never ask somebody to, remo to remove it from the fireplace. In my mother tongue, it says, You don't do it. He will raise somebody better. He will remove it from the fireplace. And people will enjoy the move. Others will be blessed. You will be left out. Let us sing this song as we reflect on our eyes. Because we want to remain relevant. And we don't want God to regret. Praise the Lord. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches gain I can but lost and poor contempt on all my pride. Now, na kama tu yo yo. Iyo version ni nachanganya watu. Siniliona mukikura mdomo. Okay, maybe use the other one. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died my Oh, no.
I would want us to pray. And even as we pray, maybe as I was speaking, the Lord brought it to your mind of some things you need to put right and rearrange yourself according to his instructions before the verdict that he regrets. And maybe you'd want me to include you in this prayer. I want you to lift up your hand as I make this prayer. Thank you for those hands. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you this morning. You are a God of mercy. Thank you for reminding us that love so amazing, so divine, demands our soul, our life, our all. Calls us to obey you according to your instructions. We pray that none of us will go there. That Lord you will regret. Because we have built monuments of worship. Worshipping the very blessings. The very victories that you have given us. I want to pray for my brothers and my sisters that have lifted up their hands. That God you will have mercy. Thank you that when we take responsibility, you are a God of mercy. Won't you have mercy this morning? Give us another chance. Give us another chance. We plead that you don't give it to somebody else. We are willing to style up and do it according to your will, O oh God. I pray that you may remember every hand that is lifted up. May you have mercy upon us and cause us to serve you because we love you. We honor you and bless you for hearing our prayer. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.